What's going on, everybody? Matt here, back for another Mock Draft Monday video. We did a rookie mock last week uh, for Superflex, and we're definitely going to dive more into those as we move into NFL draft season. We've got the Senior Bowl coming up here in just over a week. Then we'll move heavily into, obviously, a ton of NFL draft stuff. So I wanted to bring a couple more mocks um, from different perspectives before we dive into the rookie stuff. For today, we're going to do a Devi mock, just one round. I'm going to give you guys some quick thoughts on that. And then moving forward next week, we'll actually have a rookie mock draft before by four of us on the NFL draft team uh, to kind of give you some different perspectives on that as I did it last time by myself. Now I might bring you a Debbie mock later on in the week, but we will definitely pivot heavy towards some NFL rookie talk here with, uh, with that coming around. It's, it's NFL draft season already with, with the, with the incredible games that we've had this weekend um, that just ended up yesterday with the divisional round. It's going to be a whole lot more fun moving forward, but for today we're going to do a Debbie mock draft. <music> All right, so here we go. I'm excited about this. I'm going to just give you my picks and then how kind of my thought process on them and, and, and why I'm going about this route the way that I will, uh, just like I did in that rookie mock. And so we're going to start with the 1.01. When I'm sitting here, college football, you know, we're looking at, you know, especially Superflex. A lot of leagues have moved on to Superflex. So you may be thinking, am I going to go quarterback here? Caleb Williams, Drake, man, you've got a ton of great running backs, Trey on Henderson. Braylon Allen, Nicholas Singleton, Raheem Sanders. But I'm going to go with, at least in my opinion, who is the best player in all of college football right now. And I just don't see any way that they don't succeed next year and get probably top 10 draft capital. That's Marvin Harrison Jr. I just don't see how this dude fails. I really don't. He is an incredibly good wide receiver already as a sophomore. He's now heading into his junior year. He's likely going to get to play with uh, his uh, previous quarterback teammate and Kyle McCord. They were teammates all through high school, put up incredible numbers together. And I do think that he's going to win this job here at Ohio state. As you can see down there at the bottom, the top athletic comparison. So this is not a play style comparison. That I'm giving you guys just go straight from our athletic database based on their testing numbers and everything they do. And it's Michael Thomas. And if you can think of what Michael Thomas was able to do at the NFL level, that's pretty exciting from an athletic standpoint. And I do think Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr. has a shot to be really, really good. So he's the one I'm taking here at 1-1 one, one in a Debbie mock draft. It puts me up now 1.2. This point, you're kind of having that same argument I just had. Do, do you go the quarterback, right? You know, quarterback is money. It's key here in the you know drafts whenever you move on to the NFL, especially in Debbie, because a lot of these guys – will get taken early, and you can't necessarily build a quarterback pipeline without those Debbie picks, um, especially if they take the top guys there. But I'm not doing it. I'm going Travion Henderson, and I know this might seem like a homer pick, but he's been good. He had a really incredible freshman season where he did not play football for an entire year. Uh, he was one of the players who I actually opted out. I uh, do. They did not technically cancel the high school football season in Virginia. He opted out due to COVID comes into Ohio state and puts up incredible numbers. Last year, he was beat up, tore some ligaments in his foot, broke some bones in his foot, still tried to play through it. And then toward the end of the year, just kind of stopped. Uh, there was definitely a lot of frustration. I know he aired some of that on Twitter. I believe he ended up deleting some of the tweets, but there's definitely some frustration there. And I don't blame him. Right. I mean, when you're out there trying to, you know, slog through these tough games with broken bones in your foot and ligaments. And, and, and you got Ohio state fans telling you, you suck. Other people telling you, you suck. You're probably fairly frustrated. I get it. I think he's going to remind everybody this junior year though, how good he really is. You see the athletic comp there, LaShawn McCoy. I actually think there's some pretty fair play style comps there as well. He's a really good receiver. He's, he's more kind of like to, to hate to use LaShawn McCoy's nickname here. He's more sh kind of shady and shifty than he is necessarily a guy who's going to run you over. Um, he doesn't, I'm going to be honest, force a lot of missed tackles. Henderson doesn't, but he just finds ways to get into the open field and make big plays. And, and I do think he's going to remind a lot of people just how good he is next year uh, with his play at Ohio State. I think he's going to vault up, and he's probably one of the guys you're going to be able to get. Um, this is probably the cheapest you're going to be able to get him in Debbie drafts, at least in my opinion. After that, though, we are going quarterback. Taking Caleb Williams. He's the best quarterback in college football right now. And I don't have an issue if, if you, again, super flex leads, if you take him at 1-1 or 1-2. Because, again, as I mentioned, you build that pipeline through your Debbie picks. 
my big fear with quarterbacks, and, and you'll as you're going to see when we go through this, there's not a lot of them in this mock. Granted, it's only 12 picks. I am worried about some of these guys translating to the NFL. Caleb, I feel like, is the least of my fears. Now, you look at that athletic comp there, it's Tyrod Taylor. Again, that just comes more from like rushing um, and, and some testing numbers, right? I'm not saying that he's not, he's going to be Tyrod Taylor. He's not. He's much, 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 much better. But he's not like this super elusive, like Lamar Jackson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields type rusher. He also doesn't run a ton, which I actually kind of like. If you watch him play, um, now he did run a little bit more at Oklahoma, but I think that was, again, he's true freshman. He was just trying to figure it out. At USC, he did a lot more kind of maneuvering around behind the line of scrimmage to buy time to throw down the field, which is what we like from our quarterbacks. He will run when needed, but he doesn't necessarily just do that all the time. He's got plenty of arm strength. Like, he's going to be good. Uh, you make bet on USC, or not USC, on Lincoln Riley quarterbacks, right? Like, he's put these guys in the NFL. They've all practically succeeded, I guess, really outside of Baker Mayfield right now because Kyler Murray has been good when not beating up. Jalen Hurts is possibly going to be going to a Super Bowl here, depending on what they do this weekend. Like, he's been incredible. They, that's just what he's done. He, he's had multiple Heisman winners. It, it, Lincoln Riley knows what he's doing at quarterback. And Caleb Williams, I think, is going to be is the least quarterback to be worried about moving forward. Don't really have any questions about him. So, again, if you want to take him one, one, or one, two, no issues with that whatsoever. For me, though, I'm taking guys that I do think have a little bit more upside. And I, I probably could have taken him over Travion. That was probably a bad pick now I'm thinking about it. But Marvin Harrison Jr. for me just feels like the one player that I just don't think is going to lose any value. So I am taking him here, though, at three. Which then puts me up at Mecca at Buka, who's having and it had an incredible season. I'm sorry, I put having. Had an incredible season. I think got widely overshadowed by Marvin Harrison Jr. Top five receiving yards in Ohio State history last year. As he finished number five, Marvin Harrison Jr. finished number three on that list. That's a really good season. I think he's got a shot to be even better this year. You know, showed out a little bit as a freshman, not much. Then really kind of burst on the scene this year. But again, I think mostly got overshadowed by how great Marvin Harrison Jr. was. Now that we know there's going to be no JSN, like it's going to be the Marvin Harrison Jr. show, Mecca, I think, is going to take a big step forward. You know, Julian Fleming just hasn't been able to stay healthy. I think Mecca is going to have a massive, massive season, and I don't think that Jerry Judy is necessarily even a bad play comp for him either. Probably not a fair one, um, especially with what Jerry Judy's been in the NFL, and that probably skews my thought process because I think he's going to be much better than Jerry Judy. But I think Mecca's ceiling is the roof, as Michael Jordan would say. I love Mecca. I think he's got a ton of talent. He's going to be a very good NFL wide receiver as well. But as I mentioned with Caleb Williams, I wouldn't have minded if you took Drake May right there. But I'm taking him here at five. Look, he had a phenomenal first year really playing. He, he was a true freshman two years ago. Didn't really see the field. I believe he had nine attempts. We can't judge that. This year, though, Goes out, has an amazing season, struggles a little bit. You should expect that from a true freshman. Again, people may not remember this. Caleb Williams did struggle in multiple games, actually got benched in a game. But then look at what he did this year. Drake May going into his second season as a starter in 2023, I think it's going to be phenomenal. Now, he does not have a top athletic comp. Uh, one Felix Sharp has compared him a lot to Aaron Rodgers. That's a fair comp. Uh, I, I don't think he's quite Aaron Rodgers. I think uh, arm talent, uh, definitely more of a rusher than Aaron Rodgers ever was. Um, I really don't know who I'd compare him to, but if he goes out there again and has another amazing season for North Carolina, then I get the argument of, again, taking him up there at 1-2. If you want to take Caleb at 1 and Drake May at 1-2, I get the arguments. I really do. Um, and a lot of that, again, is because of the nature of the position and the value added. For me, there was a couple other players I just liked a little bit more in Travion Henderson and Mecca, and I believe what their long-term value can hold. And I do have some reservations about Drake May. It's not a ton. Uh, it's not like I don't think he's going to be good. But after one year, and granted, I will say neither one of these players put up the numbers that Drake May did, But and, and I do think he's much better than these, but you have to say this. They're, they're, you have to put the disclaimer out there. A couple years ago, we had DJU and Spencer Rattler as the locked-in 101 and 102 quarterbacks in those drafts in Campus to Canton drafts and Debbie drafts. We were all taking them. We looked pretty foolish. 
after this season with what both of those guys did. Not that I think Caleb, um, Caleb or Drake may it's mostly about Drake may not that I think Drake may is going to go out there and, and completely shit the bed in his second year. He's not, he's likely going to be very good, but I do think you, it's okay to have some reservations about quarterbacks. And the other thing is, is like, I feel like right now, if you look at these running back wide receiver quarterback rooms and everything, there's such great talent at the top, but I feel like there's a pretty decent drop off. Once you get past a couple picks, quarterback right now I do think is a little bit of a a dice roll outside of maybe Caleb and Drake so maybe that's why you take him up at the top but I feel like there's a lot of value later on in these drafts that you can get quarterbacks and because it's deep in essence of like the players that we think could hit at the NFL level you can take these guys later in your in your Debbie drafts and and if you end up missing out on someone in the third round if you get like Cade Klubnik in the third round okay big deal because you just landed Marvin Harrison Jr. and whomever else in the second round who both end up being really good and moving on to the NFL. So that's kind of the way I attack Debbie drafts. And that's the way I'm doing it here. Like my strategy would be to wait on quarterback, take them in the second round or end of the first, second round, third round, and try and grab a guy who has a lot of upside that may not be at Caleb William Drake May's level right now, unless you just really, really need a quarterback. All right. Enough about that though. Drake may have five again. I, I understand the argument. If you want to take him higher, Puts us up at six, and I'm taking Raheem Sanders. I think there is an argument for him, and check out that comp, right? Jim Brown. That's nice. There's definitely an argument to have him as the RB1 over Travion Henderson. Uh, Had like 20 catches this past year. Travion Henderson, I believe, had zero. Like, they did not throw him the ball. Sanders is just a big bully who's got decent speed. Uh, we thought maybe he was extremely fast. I did see him get brought down from behind a couple times this year. Not to say that he's still not fast. He is. Um, and I still think there's a little rawness to his game, though. He is a converted, I believe, linebacker. Linebacker or wide receiver. I can't remember off the top of my head now, but converted to the running back position. Was pretty Okay, his freshman season, great year this past year. A little bit banged up, but still, when he was on the field, was incredible. So I think there's definitely an argument to take him over. Travion Henderson is RB1 if you want to. For me, I feel like this is the best spot to get him. I really think Drake May, as you can see right here next to me, Drake May, Emeka Buka, Caleb Williams, Travion Henderson, and Marvin Harrison should all go ahead of him personally. And I think this is the perfect spot to take Raheem Sanders. He, he's you know got receiving chops, and I think he's going to be a really good receiving back in the NFL. But he's also a guy who, if he continues to progress with what he's shown us, improving that vision, improving that lateral speed behind the line of scrimmage, he's going to be a really good running back as well. So Raheem Sanders, I think, is a great pick here after those top guys go off the board. Takes me to a 1-7 here, and I'm taking Nicholas Singleton, running back out of Penn State. True freshman this year. Incredible season. He was our fastest player last year out of the freshman class. We had him clocked at 22 miles per hour flat. No one else got up into that range. We've had a couple guys in this 2023 class that have broken that, but that doesn't matter. Nicholas Singleton, phenomenal. Again, same thing I think you could argue about him with some of the things I mentioned about Raheem Sanders. He's still a little bit raw. In high school, he played in Pennsylvania in an area that didn't necessarily have a lot of top-end uh, football players that going into college or would end up going into the NFL either, really. He was by far the best athlete on the field, didn't really have to try that hard to just outrun, out-muscle you know, muscle anybody on the field. And there were definitely a lot of times, and, and, and I don't blame him for this, the coaching staff knew he had more speed than everybody, more strength than everybody, they would just give them a ton of these runs just going to the outside. And just like, just go beat him up, Singleton. Just go get it. And that's exactly what he would do. So we had some questions about what he would be as a receiver and what he would be kind of going up the middle coming into Penn State. Well, he answered at least going up the middle questions. He looked phenomenal. They didn't really throw him the ball a ton. I'm okay with that. I, I don't necessarily think that he can't do it. I've comped him to Nick Chubb. And... You hear that, and you may say, okay, well, Nick Chubb didn't catch the ball a lot either. No, he hasn't, and I definitely think you have to have him land in the right scheme in the NFL to be extremely productive, like a Nick Chubb has with the Cleveland Browns, Kevin Stefanski, and that crew just want to run the ball. If Nicholas Singleton ends up in a spot like this, he's going to be an absolute smash. I think he's going to be a smash regardless. I would be fine even taking him over Raheem Sanders. The big thing with him is you have to wait another year. My one thing, too, if you look at all the guys who've gone in the first six picks, you only have to go through the 23 season before they hit your NFL roster. Nicholas Singleton is so far the first one where you have to wait two seasons. 
but I just think the talent is there. He is so incredibly gifted, and his upside is, I think, is Saquon Barkley, who his top athletic comp is, and I think he's going to test fairly well to that. Penn State just does a really great job when it comes to those guys testing and moving on to the NFL. Singleton is a guy I don't think is – He's someone I don't think is going to be a miss at this point. Not when he looked as good as he did as a true freshman. I expect, expect I think this Penn State D offense is going to be even better in 2023. So I think we could see a much better Nick Singleton moving forward. So that puts us at 1 8. I'm taking my guy, Quinchon Judkins, another player you have to wait two years for. But he had an incredible freshman season. I was the train conductor for him, right? If you go back to me tweeting about him, I think he was in like December of 2021, like before he had even, it was before he even had taken a snap at Ole Miss. He had signed with Ole Miss, but he hadn't done anything with Ole Miss on the field. And I was telling you, this kid is going to be special. You check out our freshman guy. I put in there, dude's going to crush it as a CFF asset in the 2022 season because I felt like he just fit that offense so well. Well, he did. Went out there, had an incredible season, even with Zach Evans in that backfield. And what's even crazier for me is I think he can get better. In high school, they lined him up in the slot and outside, and he actually ran routes. He's a good receiving back. He, he's not someone who's can – he fights the ball when it comes into him. Like, he can actually catch the ball. They didn't use him like that at all this year at Ole Miss. Zach Evans gone. I think Quinchon's going to be the guy. Now, they are bringing in another freshman, Kedrick Riscano, who is really good. I don't think he's going to challenge Quinshawn as much in, in the fact I think Quinshawn's going to be the guy. He's going to put up a lot of yards and, and a lot of touches. But same argument I just made with Nick Singleton there. Like, you're going to, have to wait two years to get him, which you don't love for a running back. But I just think he's going to be that talented. I personally think he should be the RB2 here behind Nick Singleton. But I, if I'm being honest, I don't think the ceiling is there. As as a Nick Singleton, now you see the top athletic comp here is Miles Sanders. I think he's a, he's a better running back. He's definitely more physical than Miles Sanders, but I, I don't think that his ceiling is Nicholas Singleton. So for me, Nick Singleton's going to likely always stay ahead of him because he didn't do any reason to not to to be brought back to the pack. And and Quinshawn runs roughly the same uh, speed. I don't think it was quite twenty two, but it was like twenty one point seven. Like he's he's fast. He's got good speed. And he's definitely doing against SEC competition. So if you want to give him a boost for that, that's fine. I'm not double counting that, though, because the Big Ten defenses are built to stop the run. And they couldn't do that with Singleton. So I think he should be firmly behind Singleton in that RB class. If you want to bump him ahead of it, I'm not going to argue with you. I think they're the top two guys. Again, the biggest thing with these two at seven and eight here is you do have to wait two full seasons before you get them because they're both going into their sophomore year. It puts me up at one nine, taking Brock hours that athletic comp too i don't think that far off in george kittle now he's not gonna have the the weight that george kittle has i believe brock's still sitting around like 230 you will you want to see your tight ends up in the 245 range and i don't think brock's gonna get there but he's gonna be really good i mean this dude just finds ways to get open we've seen the nfl is not afraid to take these really athletic tight ends and and figure out ways to use them on the field. And I think that they're going to, the whoever drafts him is going to do that. He's likely going to be a top 10 pick. There's really not much to say. I, I personally would not take him any earlier than this. And I debated on not even taking him here at one nine, but I just think he's by far the best at the position. And if you want to have that, uh, that player that is just much better than anybody else at their position, then that's why you got to take Brock Bowers here because there's no other tight end. I think even needs to be in the discussion. Um, you know, I know there was some talk last year about some other tight ends possibly jumping up there. You got Ole Miss tight end, and for the life of me, can't remember his name right now, um, but transferred over with Jackson Dart from USC. We all thought like there were going to be some other tight ends that kind of came up and, and challenged a little bit. None of them did. Brock Bowers is just special, and, and I think he's going to be special going into the NFL. Great thing is, too, you only have to have him for one more year here at Georgia. You know, so if you want to take a guy and kind of win a position, like knowing every week, like, hey, Brock Bowers, you draft him here. Top 10 pick in the NFL would be my guess. He's probably going in your starting lineup every single week. He's just kind of a set it and forget it guy. Now, he may not actually be what George Kittle was in his prime. I don't think the testing numbers are going to be that far off, though. Like, he, he's going to be good. He's going to be good. Let's go to 110 here. Taking Xavier Worthy. You might say, man, that's kind of a massive drop for Xavier Worthy. His comp is also Jerry Judy. 
Here's my fear with Xavier Worthy. 165 pounds. He's used a lot as this um, deep threat slash yak threat at Texas. And my thing is, as a freshman, we had two concerns about him. Two. Two concerns. Struggle with drops. Struggle with ball tracking. Fast forward to his sophomore year, the year we just had where I get it. 900 yards as a freshman. Like, I'm not knocking him for that. He was phenomenal as a freshman. He deserved all the praise he got for his breakout and looked amazing. And I'm not trying to say that he's a bad player. But he didn't improve at all. That does worry me a little bit. You're struggling with drop issues. You struggle with ball tracking. Come into your sophomore season. I get it. Quinn Ewers was bad at times. Like, don't. I, I get it. I get it. But it's not all on him. You go back and watch some of those big games, the Alabama game, because it wasn't just Quinn throwing him a ball in that game where he dropped balls to struggle with ball tracking. It's Hudson Card as well. You go back to the Oklahoma State game. You go back to the TCU game. You go back to the bowl game where he only got credited with, like, I think two drops in that game, and he had four. He just struggles watching the ball in his hand and holding on to it, and he struggles deep-wise. Like, he just seems to struggle tracking the deep ball. I don't know why. The other thing that worries me a little bit is about this kid's, like, wanted to leave everywhere he's been. For those of you who don't know, he actually was signed with Michigan before pulling back from that and flipping to Texas. Then after his freshman season, rumors were he wanted out of Texas. He didn't like being there. He didn't like what the quarterback room was. Didn't think he was going to be a playmaker. And all of a sudden decides to stay. The same rumors and everything came up again this year. He was frustrated with Quinn Ewers and the way the offense ran. He was going to go to USC like, dude, figure it out. Because that's not the only problems here. You have your own problems as well. A lot of people compare him to Hollywood Brown. I personally do not remember Hollywood Brown struggling at all with the, with the ball tracking. In fact, I thought he was phenomenal at that. I really don't remember him struggling with drops. You guys can tell me in the comments if I'm wrong there. I don't remember Marquise Hollywood Brown struggling with drops in college. I know he's had some pretty bad ones in the NFL and screwing Lamar Jackson and the Ravens at times. I don't really remember him in college. So I'm not saying that Xavier Worthy can't get there. But personally, the growth, the development, and honestly, just the production I've seen out of Marvin Harrison Jr. and Mecca put them clearly ahead of Xavier Worthy for me because they're also both decent size. Like, I do think you have to question a little bit Xavier Worthy being 165. I don't think it's going to hold him back. Don't think it's going to cause him to possibly not be a first-round pick in the NFL draft next year. But I just don't see the upside I see with Mecca and Marvin at this point. Now, maybe he comes out there and blows us all away. And I'm rooting for him to do that. Like, I don't have anything against Xavier Worthy. But if we're putting everything in context, I think the questions that we had after his freshman season to still have them in his sophomore year is kind of a little bit questionable. And, and I don't like it. Moving on to 111, Braylon Allen, another guy. I've been a little bit lower on than consensus. Comp, there's Beanie Wells. Everybody else tells you the comp is Derrick Henry. He's not Derrick Henry, folks. He's just not. And, and it's not a bad thing either. Derrick Henry is a unicorn. He is one of one. We're not likely ever going to see another Derrick Henry. Maybe we will in Roderick Robinson the second, who is going to be a true freshman going to Georgia this year. He's in a very elite club there with being over 230 pounds and runs over 22 miles per hour. Braylon Allen is a good running back. I'm not trying to tell you that he's not. He is, and I, I could kind of come up with the term for this, and, and my good friend over here at the network, Colin Decker, put it out, and I think it's the perfect phrasing for him. He's a runway runner. If that hole is there, Braylon Allen hits it, chances are you're not bringing him down or catching him. For a back who's 230 pounds, he can book it. He ain't booking it to 22 miles per hour like Derrick Henry can, but he's going to get up to, nine, to, I believe we have him over 20. So that's very fast. A average speed is 20 and below. So he is above average speed in 20. He might even be 21. I don't remember off the top of my head, folks. But he is fast. I, I have no issues with that. But And I get it. The next thing is going to be thrown around. I'm sure someone in the comments is going to mention, well, he was only 17 years old. Now he's 18. I don't care, guys. Like, that's great. But we still need to see progression. And the same thing I have in my arguments about Xavier Worthy is the same thing I have in my arguments here with Braylon Allen. We haven't seen that much development, guys. He still struggles with vision. I think his his footwork, I do I will give him props here. I think they got a little bit better. I saw him hit a couple cutback lanes uh, this past year. But if you go look at that schedule, they did not play 
anybody tough. Outside of, I guess, Ohio State, although I'd argue Ohio State's defense still struggled a little bit, and he just struggled to put up yards against some teams. At the end of the year, his stats looked fine, but if you go back and look at some of those, I don't even remember the team. He played in FCF school, FCS school in like week one or two. It was like Illinois State or something like that. Had got bottled up for like 40 yards the entire game before he broke off a 98-yard touchdown run. Same thing with Ohio State. He was bottled up, breaks off a big 80-yard touchdown run against a third-string defense, guys. Like, it's not that I think Braylon Allen is bad, but I think he's more boom-bust than what most people want to say he is. We talk, There's a lot of people out here in these communities who talk about how he's better than Raheem Sanders. He's better than Travion Henderson. And he's better than Nicholas Singleton. Like, I don't think the consistency is there at all with Braylon Allen. I think he's very boom bust. I think that if, you know, he continues to improve, he's got a shot to be a very good running back in the NFL. But the other question I have about him, and again, it's not necessarily a fair, like, it's not necessarily a knock on him because he hasn't been asked to do it, but he has not done a lot receiving wise either. And you can go back and look through Wisconsin's history, and I have. A lot of those running backs have it until their final year, so that could be a big thing for Braylon Allen this year. Go back to Melvin Gordon, Jonathan Taylor, um, Monte Ball. Like You go and look at what those guys did through their first couple seasons. It was like four or five catches of an entire season, nothing massive. But then in their final season, of it, it was Jonathan Taylor Jr., I think Monte Ball Jr., but Melvin Gordon's senior season. All of those guys ended up having great receiving years. They got like 10 to 20 catches. If Braylon Allen can do that, that question gets wiped away, but we really haven't seen it. He fights the ball right now. I want to see him improve on that a little bit before I jump him up there into that top tier. All right, enough about Braylon Allen. Let's go to 112, and I am taking Quinn Ewers here. So look, I actually think Aaron Rodgers is a fair comp for Quinn Ewers. Here's the thing. I know a lot of people are going to look at that and be like, come on, Matt, really? Look. He had not played for two full seasons before this year. The last time he took like real competitive snaps, I believe he was 17 years old to South Lake Carroll in his junior season in a state championship against Cade Klupnik. And I believe it was Lake Travis or West Lake. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure it was West Lake now that I think about it. Coming off double groin surgery. Double groin surgery. Where you can go back and look this up. I'm pretty sure he's talked about this openly. I know for a fact, because I've actually talked to the coach, the doctors told the head coach, he can't run. If he runs, he has a chance to tear his groins. Don't let him run. He's got to stay in the pocket. And he didn't look horrible. His feet, his footwork was bad this year. It was really bad. But I believe in what Steve Sarkeesian can do, and I also believe in the Texas offense. You go back and look at Steve Sarkeesian's history in developing quarterbacks, and it is pretty good. I think you could argue, while it's not there with Lincoln Riley, I think you could argue it's right there with Ryan Day with what he did with Tua, Mac Jones. He got Jake Locker first round draft couple. He got Cody Kessler drafted in top three rounds in the NFL draft. And Matt Ryan had one of his best NFL fantasy seasons ever in his career when Steve Sarkeesian was calling plays for Atlanta. He knows how to work with quarterbacks and build them up. Quinn Ewers was not benched at all this year when they had Hudson Card. You can say what you want, but Hudson Card played well in Alabama, possibly wins that game if he doesn't roll his ankle. Probably Alabama loses that game if Quinn doesn't get hurt. And maybe that's what hurt him this year. He dealt with a shoulder injury. He dealt with a thumb injury. When you have injuries like that and you can't continue to just kind of get better and progress, I do think that that hurts your development. This is the year, though, for Quinn, because I don't think Arch is sitting for two. But now he's got a full spring to lead in all of the practice, all of those reps as the number one, and an improved offensive line. Four, Three or four of those guys were freshmen. They had a pretty good year overall, but still, he was pressured a lot this past year. Now they're all coming in their second year, really good offensive line, weapons for days around him. I know they lose Bichon, but they got Jonathan Brooks. They got Cedric Baxter Jr. is coming as a freshman. I think it's going to be really good. Just mentioned Xavier Worthy. They're going to have Isaiah Nayor back. They just got Adnai Mitchell, or I believe he changed his name to A.D. Mitchell. They just get A.D. Mitchell from Georgia, who's a true deep speed threat. Jay Tavian Sanders or JT Sanders at tight end. And then they get John Tay Cook and DeAndre Morris freshman coming at wide receivers. Both are really, really talented wide receivers. Going to have the talent around him for days. I think this is the cheapest you're going to be able to get him. And I know a lot of people are off on him. He was a guy who I believe was going as a top five pick in Debbie drafts last year. A lot of people are going to tell you 
this is bad process and I'm fine with that. Maybe, maybe I'm sticking too much to my priors here and too much to my thoughts and taking Quinn here. But again, I mentioned earlier, I'm fine kind of missing on Caleb and Drake and taking a higher end guy. And then here at 112 or in the second, third round, taking a quarterback who has that upside. And I do think Quinn has it because whatever you guys think about Quinn Ewers, if he goes out there and has a good season, sure, he may not get drafted above Caleb, may not get drafted above Drake May, but he's going to be a first round pick because recruiting stars matter and the name matters. He is one of in a very elite group in a guy who had a perfect rating from 24 seven sports. And while I don't always agree with 24 seven sports, historically speaking, I believe over the past decade plus, they've shown to be the best in predicting who gets top NFL draft capital. And all of those guys got the top per- perfect percentage guys, the 1000% all got really high in draft capital. Now, they didn't all work out in the NFL. I believe the best has been Jadavion Clowney, who you could question has been, you know, decent at times, or I felt like he's been good, also dealt with a lot of injuries. But they've all succeeded. They've all got drafted fairly highly, and they've all at least made it to the NFL. I don't think Quinn's going to be the one who breaks that trend. In fact, I really do think all those people bailing on Quinn after one year, sitting for two years, and we've talked about it. We're, we're willing to give Will Levis a pass. We're willing to give Anthony Richardson a pass. We're willing to give all these quarterbacks passes who haven't played for two years, but then Quinn goes out there and has a couple good games. And I will be honest, he has some really bad games. There's no doubt about it. He played really poorly at times. But we're not going to give him a pass. Why? Because people pumped him up and we're excited to see him. Fine. If you want to blame me for that, I'll take the blame. But I still saw a lot of really incredible plays. You go to that Oklahoma game, he had a play where he side-armed it through two defenders. Like, the talent's there. It just wasn't consistently there. And if he's able to consistently put it together, I think all those people fading, Quinn, are going to kind of regret it this year and something I'm looking forward to. So, that wraps up the first round here for the mock. We're just going to do one. We're going to do two next week, I think, of Devier. Maybe we'll do a campus to Canton one. I'm not sure, but just to run through it again here, if you're looking on the side of the screen, Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver from Ohio State. Number two, running back from Ohio State, Travion Henderson. Number three, USC quarterback Caleb Williams. Number four, Ohio State wide receiver Emeka Egbuka. Number five, North Carolina quarterback Drake May. Number six, Arkansas running back Raheem Sanders. Number seven, Penn State running back Nicholas Singleton. Number eight, Ole Miss running back Quinn Sean Judkins. Number nine, Georgia tight end Brock Bowers. Number 10, Texas wide receiver Xavier Worthy. Number 11, Wisconsin running back Braylon Allen. And number 12, Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers. Let me know what you guys think. Who would you have taken over? Maybe Quinn, because I feel like he's going to be the most controversial pick here in this draft for most of you. Let me know in the comments who you would have taken over him. You could argue Will Shipley, maybe one of the freshmen, and Jonte Cook, Brandon Ennis, who are getting a lot of love. Would you take in a Drew Alar, Penn State quarterback over him? Let me know who you would have taken over Quinn here at pick 12. Outside of that, guys, we'll talk to you guys again next Monday for another rookie mock draft video. Have yourselves a 